Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, I know there'll be a few other folks coming in as we get going, but we're going to kick things off. And I've got a few announcements just to lay out a few things for you real quick here as we get going. And the first thing is I want to say a huge thank you uh, to our mission team. And uh, what you see on the walls around you, the, the, the decor, things out here in the hallway, things that have been made and designed and, and planned for this, for this event and for, for future endeavors here at Grace Fellowship Church, uh, the mission team has just done a great job of uh, putting that together. I think we even have a, a, a slide because I wanted you to see who some of these folks are, just so you know that uh, the mission team is about eight or nine people on there, and uh, they do a great job of being creative, of, of praying, of, of thinking about these endeavors, where our church is at and where God was have it, would have us to be. So I just want you to see those names of those people. If you're wondering... Uh, they meet about at least once a month and uh, are doing things behind the scenes throughout the months uh, to think about what God wants to do through our church. So a big hand to them. Right. Also, you are invited to bring toys. Thanks to you for those of you who, who did bring toys today for Operation Christmas Child, which is something that we're going to be doing here in a couple of weeks at our weekend event, putting together some shoe boxes and doing some other things involving that. If you didn't bring them tonight, you can still bring toys on Sunday and just drop them off here by the door. And there's, a, there's already a little uh, box out there that says toys. So thanks for being involved in that. Uh, one thing you can't see because you're facing the wrong way right now, but we have a prayer room now. Uh, that whole back area was cleaned out. Uh, it's being used for, for a variety of things this year, but right now it is a prayer room. It, most of you haven't seen it. You need to go check it out. It doesn't look like any other room you've ever seen. Uh, it's to pray for the nations. It's to pray for things going on here at church. It's praying for whatever is going on in your heart. So make sure before you leave, you check out uh, our prayer room. It's been uh, uh, decored pretty amazingly. So uh, also, uh, make sure you got a, a, a bold booklet uh, that we're going to use on our Sunday messages, on our Wednesday messages. You can just keep track of the notes and things on here. Uh, we're going to be put them on, putting the, all the messages on our app. We're going to video this one here in just a little bit as well so that people can go back and watch them later on. If anybody needs a, a bold booklet, Matt's got some right over here, just in case. Uh, and make sure you use those. They all should have one of these flyers as well to let you know kind of the other events that are coming up, to let you know that next week is Asian cuisine for dinner, uh, to make sure you bring... And then a lot of stuff about our weekend event, the Friday and Saturday event that's coming up here in a couple of weeks, which is going to be an amazing time. A lot of activities, a lot of things that we'll be doing together as a church that weekend as well. So make sure you check that out. Uh, also, um, oh, forgot this one big thing. Uh, special, special note here. <clears throat> This is J-term rule number 62. Some of you who are generous, and when there's leftover food, people take it back to the kitchen so that next supper can use it on Thursdays. They can't use it because next supper can only use food that has been prepared that day or is in cans. So if you have a can of something that's left out there on the table, you can drop it off for next supper. But any of our leftovers, sometimes people don't want to throw it away and they leave it here for people, they can't use it. And they just got to toss it. So please, as you're cleaning up and everything, just know if you got the casseroles and all that kind of stuff, uh, take it home or give it to somebody else to take home. But, but next supper, appreciate your generosity, but just can't use those kind of things. So make sure we don't leave food back there tomorrow that they would then have to clean up tomorrow or anything else like that. So thanks for helping me with J-term rule number 62. Uh, and then last, uh, we got a special guest with us here tonight, Larry Neese, and uh, is going to be sharing with us uh, here on our first Wednesday at J-term. Uh, many of you know Larry because he's visited here and, and taught here a handful of times before. He is, was formerly uh, a lead pastor of a couple churches in the Northeast for many years. And for the last 10, 13 years, how many years were you at Grace? 16. 16. 16. 16 years at Grace Fellowship in Johnson City as a missions and outreach pastor and a variety of, 
uh, of things that he did over there. And uh, we're excited to have him here because of his giftedness in teaching and his experiences in going around the world to share the gospel. And he currently, and even while he was working at Grace Johnson City, he was involved in an organization called B World. And the B stands for Biblical Education by Extension. And what that means is he and a team of people and a variety of folks uh, provided seminary-level teaching and training for people in a lot of Asian countries and Middle Eastern countries, pastors and church leaders who have no access to something like that. And they would go there and do these kinds of tra seminary-level training for them because they don't have a school down the street that they can go to. So he's going to be sharing more of his story uh, here with us uh, as he gets going and some of his experiences of being out there in the world uh, and being on mission. Uh, and we're excited to have him. Will you go ahead and give him a hand, please? Thank him for coming. Uh, and with that, Tim. Uh, Tim Pitts is on our mission team, and I've asked him to kind of come up here and pray for us, pray for Larry, and what God wants to do in our hearts tonight. Let's pray. Dear God, we praise your wonderful and great name and thank you, Lord, that we can meet together and just see the work that you're going to do. God, I lift up Larry to you. Lord, I pray that your spirit uh, just speaks through him, God, and what you want to say to us about reaching the world for the gospel. God, I pray, Lord, that your kingdom will come and that your word would spread to every nation, tribe, and tongue. God, that you would open up inroads into the hard to reach places God that you'll send forth workers and God I pray that you'll create in each one of us here a great passion for what you're passionate about that every every person hears the gospel and hears the great news of all that he has done God and Lord just bless this time tonight Lord in Jesus name Amen Alright another big hand for Larry as he walks yeah. in <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, fun for me to be here with you. Is the mic on? Okay. Uh, I just love what's happening here. I mean, I don't know how to emphasize it anymore. I love, love, love what's going on here at Grace Kingsport. And uh, your emphasis that you have on missions is really a heartbeat of mine. And I'm a little bit nervous tonight because... I feel like I have five hours of things in me that need to get out in uh, an hour period of time. And we're gonna take some time at the end for some interaction uh, in smaller groups as I give you a couple of questions. So I'm, I'm battling the time crunch. So if I feel a little scattered, uh, that's the reason why. And I wanna share with you some, um, a perspective on missions that is grounded in scripture. Now, I know Joel spoke on, uh, from, from Genesis, I believe, of Abraham on being a blessing. And that is a part of the message that reverberates throughout Scripture. So I have a lot of Scripture. Uh, a little bit later, I'm going to be going through some verses, and I may skip through some of those because of the time, just to give you a warning. But I want you to see that what we are talking about this evening is not something that some businessman or a group of pastors came together and said, you know, we ought to do this. No, this is something from the top down. This is something directly from God himself who wants us to be involved in missions. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. And part of my goal is to convince you, if you're not convinced already, and to excite you about the possibilities of what God can do through individuals. Now, it really begins with uh, a walk in the garden. You know the story of Adam and Eve, of course, and they ate the forbidden fruit, and then what did they do? After they ate the fruit, what did they do? Yeah, they hid. And now you have the Lord God, as seems to be his pattern, walking into the garden to have just another time of conversation with Adam and Eve. And he's looking for them. And he's, he doesn't see them, and he calls out, where are you? That's missional right there. 
Now, do you think that God knew where Adam and Eve were hiding? Wouldn't it be, it'd be pretty tough to play hide and seek with God, right? Really tough. You know, he, he just knows immediately where, where you are. But he asked the question, where are you? And I think that's a profound question. And it's a question that takes all the way through Scripture, all the way through those years in the Old Testament Scripture, all the way through the New Testament, right up to where we are sitting tonight gathered together. God is seeking those who are lost. He is initiating, he is pursuing, he is going. And then as we know, he sends so that you and I are a part of that. So the theme, the focus that we have is that missions is central to God's strategy. It, it is not something extra. It is not something extra. I was talking to a friend this afternoon who passed on to me this uh, statistic, and that is that three quarters of churchgoers do not know what the term the Great Commission means. 75%, actually 76%, according to Barna Research, of those who go to church do not know what the term Great Commission means. And we're not going to unpack the Great Commission, but that's what this is all about. It is about God seeking. But I want to change things a little bit. I want to uh, increase the volume because... <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, but I want to say that missions is central to God's strategy, but I want to move it up a level. And that is that missions is central to God's heart. What I want us to catch tonight is this whole thing that we call missions is not simply a means to an end. It's not simply a strategic method. It is the pulse of God's heart. It is his character. It is his heartbeat to reconcile lost humanity, to restore them back to relationship with him. It comes right from the heart. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That's right. It isn't that God just wanted the world, but God loved the world. But it goes on. He did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Missions is about the love of God. It is about the heart of God. It is about the character of God. From the beginning of the Bible to the very end is the great recounting of God's love for fallen humanity. He reaches his creation with a redemption plan, and here's the key thing that he could accomplish totally on his own. He would be much quicker, much more efficient to just do it himself. But he doesn't. What does he do? He includes us in the process. He has chosen to involve his children, his followers, in this heartbeat for a lost world, to reach the lost world. God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, 2 Corinthians 5, be reconciled to God. Through us, God is pleading to a lost world, be reconciled to God. So now we have the heart of God, and we have the mission of God, Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost, to seek and to save that which is lost, and then God's strategy, which, of course, is going. It's the going and sending. So just a, a note about uh, B World, Bibli Biblical Education by Extension. Uh, we go to, it started in Eastern Europe, um, we're going into Eastern Europe in 1979, 
and uh, we go to places where we are not wanted, where the, the Bible is oftentimes banned, where churches are restricted, and so we try to go there because the pastors and church leaders do not have access to training. And uh, we originally we were in Eastern Europe, and uh, I'll show you just a, a few pictures here. I know you can't see them very well, but you can get an idea. And I, uh, this picture, this is me right here, by the way. And we were with our, uh, our Chinese friends uh, who were there. And uh, sometimes when we take pictures and if we, sh if we show them anywhere, of course, you put, you know, you black out the eyes. Have you have ever seen pictures like that for security purposes? And so I came up with the idea, well, instead of doing that, let's just take it from behind, and then we don't have to black out the eyes. So that's our secure picture of the brothers as we, as we meet here. But just to give you a little personal um, glimpse into my story, uh, and I've, I, again, I gotta be careful I don't get carried away. Uh, but I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I grew up in a very liberal church, and uh, around my senior year of college, or high school, I began to think of, it, there's got to be something more. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a good kid, you know, I, I went to Sunday school, I went through confirmation, I did all the things, but something is missing. What is it? And then Billy Graham showed up. I went to a Billy Graham crusade in Pittsburgh a, a month or so before going to college, and the light just went on, and I thought, wow, this is the first time I have heard this, a personal relationship with the living God. Went off to college, um, my, whole, my whole life was science and engineering, and uh, during those years in college, I was discipled, my life was transformed, and so when I graduated from college, I made this major redirect from engineering to ministry, whatever that means. <laughs> I was still new to all this, but I knew that my life had been so transformed that I had only one life to live and I had to make a choice. And for me, it was going into ministry. So I went to the Dallas Seminary and there I learned a love for the local church. And there I learned a love for the world, how desperate the world is uh, to find the message of the gospel. And those things began to ignite in me. And when I was pastoring outside of Manhattan in uh, New York City, uh, a friend came by and recruited me to go and make annual trips into Eastern Europe. And that's where my relationship with uh, BEE began. And so just to give you a, a glimpse of that, because it might help you to know a little bit of uh, some of the images that are going through my mind, uh, Here's a couple of pictures here, but we would go across the border. We'd, we'd leave Vienna, we'd go into Budapest, and it was communist. And so you now entered into the tunnel, into the cave. And I can remember, you know, there's always concern about being followed. You would sit down at a table at a restaurant or something, and you'd look at the flowers and wonder if they're bugged, and they probably were bugged. And so you would be talking with your colleague, but you could not say anything, even in the hotel room, that you didn't want the authorities to hear. And so it was a, a very clandestine environment. When we went across the border into Romania, which is where I spent most of my effort, all around Romania, uh, you would go and there would be, the train would stop in the middle of the, uh, the tracks. The guard dogs with soldiers would be lined along both sides of the train. And then in four different waves, the officials would start coming in the train. They would, one would bodily search you, another would uh, look at your records and your credentials and grill you on why you were there. Someone would come and search through all your luggage and another one would come and search the whole train compartment to make sure that nothing was being hidden. So you were just being sh shaked down <laughs> as you went into the border. Then when you, were ushered into the country, uh, you were on the dark side of the moon. There was no communication with those on the outside. You were on your own. And I remember the first time that I, I showed up in, uh, in this 
uh, one town. I was told to, to go there, and, uh, and when I arrived, if nobody was there to meet me, I was to go outside the train station, stand under the tree with a postcard in my hand, and then eventually someone would come to get me, and someone would make eye contact with me, and so that's what happened. I went there, I had a postcard, and so a young guy made eye contact with me, and I followed him at some distance, and we kind of wandered around for a while until he knew that we were not being followed. We went into his little apartment, and he immediately puts his, his uh, finger to his lips, he reaches up to the radio, and he cranks that thing up on static. So we just have this blaze of static, and then we could have a conversation. That night when we were meeting with the Romanian brothers who were in the training that we were doing, uh, they would file in over a two-hour period, uh, one here, one there. They would make their way to the, the, the apartment where they were, and they would jam into the apartment so that nobody would be suspicious something was going on there. And then we would begin our training together. But this one... Uh, uh, picture right here just brings back vivid memories. We, we were ministering in a church with husbands and wives, pastors and wives, and they were just starving for uh, input and fellowship, and so uh, we went on a picnic together. And on this picnic, I was able to do some teaching on the Christian home and marriage and the family, and then we went on a hike. And we, we hiked up into this mountainous area, and we got into this cave. And as soon as we got into the cave, where we knew there were no bugs and where nobody could see or hear us, they just let loose, sing glory, glory, hallelujah, in Romanian. And do you know how to say it in Romanian? It's glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> With, without the H. They just have put an A there, no A. That's about the only difference. But it just resonated, filled that cave, and just, you know, it must have broadcasted down to the village, down in the valley. Uh, but I can still hear that. It was, the, it was the sound of freedom, freedom in Christ, that this 40 year dictatorship under Nikolai Ceausescu could not smother out. Many of them had been arrested. Many of them had spent time in prison. They were all putting their lives on the line and their futures on the line for having us come through. Um, but they welcomed us with great joy. Uh, and each one of these represents a different story. One time, we were in a gypsy uh, church, and we were welcomed by this group, but we couldn't stay with them in anybody's home. So <clears throat> we went out to this marshy area, and they put up this tent, and this gypsy teenager and I slept in this tent along with about uh, uh, well, I don't know, 80 or 100 mosquitoes as well who, who seemed to enjoy the evening there. Uh, and uh, we just... You had fellowship together. I had a, a Romanian English dictionary. I point to a couple of words, and we kind of make our way through, through the night together. But I want you to know that there are believers around the world who love the Lord, whose hearts are just on fire for the Lord, and yet who do not have access to the wealth of training and scripture and Bible knowledge and study aids that we have here in our country. And part of what we do is to go to these locations in order to help bring this training. Now, this, that's a picture of me back in the old days uh, in a Romanian church, uh, and I went there a number of times. But when the wall came down, uh, we moved to Asia. And we started in China, and we're in uh, China and Burma and... Uh, uh, Vietnam and, and all over Asia is where we have been doing our training, Korea, Philippines. And so uh, the past 16 years, I have been involved in going to where? <laughs> yes, in Shenyang, China. And, uh, and there, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of memories, a lot of stories there, but that's where I have been focusing is the training that we have been doing. Uh, in Shenyang, China, but it's, it's the same kind of training. 
But I just want you to know that all of this started when, with a hunger in my heart that said something is missing. And when I came to faith in Christ and found that missing component, I have never gotten over the pursuit of God, the love of God for me that has propelled me into uh, ministry and into the mission field. Uh, I see myself as just an ordinary guy. Uh, I'm just uh, an engineer who went in a different direction, you know. And I can remember, and I still feel this way, it's like, Lord, I'm not like these other guys who have it all together, who can talk so well, who can teach so well, who are brilliant you know, theologians, you know, pastors. I'm not like them, but I only have one life, and I offer it to you. I want to be used of you in whatever way you can use me. And I would say, I hope that's the norm. And you don't have to go to Romania, to China, you know, these places. But I think the heart of the believer, of the follower of Jesus Christ, is going to be like the heart of God, which is always pursuing and always reaching out. And it really is the, the missio dei. Have you ever heard that term? Some of you have heard that term. The mission of God. We worship a missionary God. The Father sends the Son. The Son sends the Spirit, and together they send you and me to go and to be representatives of Jesus in every place and every relationship that we entered into. That's the Missio Dei. This is not a, a program in a church. It's not, oh, does your church have a mission program? That's not what we're talking about. Now, a mission program, a mission team, mission efforts may be an expression of this. But what we are talking about is why the church exists to begin with. Why does the church exist? It exists to express the heart of God, which is a missional heart. And that heart is reaching the world, and that heart is using the local church as an instrument to reach the world. So. I'm going to track through just real quickly some of the verses in uh, Scripture. Uh, God's promise to Abraham, I will bless you, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Psalm 67, God be gracious to us, bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us. And that's usually where we stop. We have a, a benediction, bless us. May he cause his, the light of his countenance to shine upon us. And the American church is in danger of being an us church. You know, my comfort, my problems, my issues, what can be done for me? But there's another verse. That your way may be known on the earth. That your salvation among all the nations. It's always got intention to work through us to reach the world. Isaiah, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who should I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Luke 19, for the Son of Man has come, here's his purpose, to seek and to save wasn't simply to die on the cross. That was the essential component. But the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Colossians 1, it was the God, Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile what? All things to himself, whether things in heaven or on earth. So it's the heart of God. It's not a strategy alone. It is the heart of God to reconcile all things to himself. And so Jesus said in John 20, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am 
sending you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Who can say it? Who has this verse memorized? Loud and clear. Yes, yes, right. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. That could be a geographical circles or cultural circles that are represented there. Now, a couple of uh, Sundays ago, I was in upstate New York uh, where I went to college, and we were having a, actually a reunion that I organized uh, of those of us whose lives were changed spiritually during our time in college. And so I got the word out, and we had 75 people show up. And many have gone into you know, the mission field or pastor or whatever, but 75 showed up. And so we went to a church with uh, our friends that we were staying with who were religious but not believers. And we went to this church, and it was Pentecost Sunday. And so they were reading Acts chapter 2, and they were all excited about Pentecost Sunday because they saw it and taught it as the reunification of humanity. So they went back to the Tower of Babel where the languages were confused, remember? And they all spoke a different language and they couldn't understand each other, so they had to drift away. And there was a separation, a division of humanity. But on the day of Pentecost, they all heard the, those who were anointed by the Spirit of God speaking in their own tongue. And so their whole um, understanding of this is that soul thing was humanity coming together. It was, it's a very PC liberal church, if I could use those terms. Uh, you know, in they had a liturgy in the middle of the service where everyone promised not to be a racist. And they, and they just went on with all of a, of a political approach to their faith. Now there's nothing wrong with those things, but they missed the point. You know the day of Pentecost. You know, Jews were uh, from all over had come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And during that time, the Holy Spirit came and the apostles and the others who were gathered began to speak the word in the native language of those around. Here's the punchline of the day of Pentecost. And that is, Peter stood up. When all of this crowd, when they got their attention, when people heard people, uh, individuals talking in their own language who didn't know that language, speaking in tongues, Peter stands up and he preaches the gospel. And he says in conclusion, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, why am I so upset about this <laughs> or energized by this? Well, it's because it's not about the reunification of humanity finally coming together and ignoring our differences and just loving each other. I mean, we want that, but that is only going to come when this message is communicated, that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. He is the Savior. That is the message uh, of Pentecost. And it goes on. You know, the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go, therefore. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Romans 10. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are what? sent, right? How will they preach unless they are sent? Unless they are sent. There's the going, there's the sending. There's the incarnational involvement in the mission of God, the missio dei. First Peter 2, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for 
his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has blessed you. He has moved in your heart. He has reconciled you to himself so that you may proclaim the good news of the love of God for all humanity. And then Isaiah 49, all flesh will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer. The list goes on and on. And I'd like for you, when you're reading your Bibles, just be alert. Is this to the missional statements about all the earth, all the nations, all of mankind will come to know the living God and will follow him. So uh, I have a discussion question for you, and we're going to mix it up a little bit here and have you uh, turn around and uh, form a small little pocket, a group, to uh, talk about this. But before we do that, I'm going to take just a moment. Do you have any questions or comments or, or input? I know, you know my voice uh, can be very soothing at times. And so, uh, in fact, somebody came up to me last Sunday and they said, oh, Larry, you know, I was just listening the other day to a message you gave here at Grace in 2012. And so my immediate response to him was, Oh, were you having trouble falling asleep? <laughs> uh, but it's good for us to, to interact together. Uh, but do you have any questions for me? Any, uh, any things that I've said that has sparked a question or a comment or a response? You know, I haven't been back there since the wall came down. Uh, I went back and uh, the wall came down in 89. I went back once in 1990, and I could see I was no longer needed there because the gates were open, everyone was flooding in. There was no, no need for me to be there anymore. So I'm, I went to Asia after that. So I, I really don't know. But uh, there may be some here who have been to churches in Romania since then that, uh, that would answer that question, but I'm not sure. That's a good question. What, how, how do I see the connection between... Uh, the barriers, the biggest barriers. Yeah, the, the, bar the obstacles for a North American Christian to move from, you know, God has saved me, life is good, he's going to be there for me, to becoming missional. Is that what you're saying? How do, how do you make that transition? You know, uh, I think it goes back somewhat to that 76% uh, statistic that I quoted at the beginning. You know, most people who go to church have not heard of the Great Commission. They don't know of the heart of God. They don't know of the desperate need. Uh, they have watered down, perhaps, the consequences of not knowing Christ for eternity. And so it's just kind of a, a loose, you know, uh, attitude towards it. I think the difference is what's happening here tonight in this month. I think churches like this who make, a, make missions, who make the heart of God, who make a lost world a priority for us to be concerned about and to do something about, to pray about, and to go is what's going to turn, you know, turn the, the hearts of, of people. I think we can be rocked to sleep in churches that are only there for our comfort. You know, and, and I think we need that challenge and we need the opportunity to to go, because somebody could say, well, I'd like to do something, but how do I do it? Well, that's where sometimes the short-term missions or even the, the local uh, outreach endeavors take place that can equip that person for, um, for outreach. That's, that's the best I know. I don't, I don't know there's a, you know, a, a real cure for that. But I'm concerned about the direction that the church in general is going with regards to missions. Yeah. That is 
That is a great question. Uh, do I think that in, in America that we have become maybe a little complacent over our worship of God, we take it for granted, whereas in other countries where they, they go through a lot of risk in order to meet, they go into a cave to sing glory, glory, hallelujah, full throttle. You know, I think you're, you know, I think my heart is stirred because I've been there. Uh, time and again, I have been in these situations where uh, these believers are under persecution. They are under threat, and yet their hearts are set free. And you see the, the joy in their heart and the risk that they take in order to exercise their faith. It does something to you. And I can share it with you, just give you a glimpse of it through me, but to be able to go and experience that, you're right. But, but also just to know that that's a reality in so many places. They, they, um, you know, they sacrifice for their, their faith. Very important. Excellent question. Any other questions? Romania was a, um, it's like a, a farm. Have you ever been to a farm? Okay, that's Romania. It's a, it, back then it was a very rural place. Uh, there were some cars, not a lot of cars. It's changed now, but back then uh, there would be a lot of people with horses and they would have carts and they would go down the, the muddy lane and they would be out in the field. You see fields of people hand uh, sowing and reaping out in the fields. Um, and for those of you who know have read Charles Dickens. Uh, some of those vivid Charles Dickens characters, every time I went to Romania, I felt I was stepping into a Charles Dickens book. These interesting, the gypsies and the mountain people and the, and the urchins and the, I mean, it was just filled with Charles Dickens characters all over, all trying to survive in this kind of rural area uh, that we were in. Um, should I tell you one more story real quick uh, for Romania? <laughs> uh, there was this one time we, we um, I was, you know, I was always, always took somebody from my church with me, usually a, an elder or so, and I usually brought them back too uh, <laughs> when we were done. But we would, I'd take them with me, and this time there were two of us, there were three of us, two other guys who were with me, and we were told, we were given instructions, and when you get to this place, th this pastor, Titus, is under intense persecution. I mean, he and his family, it, it's bad news, so you gotta be really careful. So when you get there, if he's not there to meet you at the train, and we had to go through the train uh, books, I mean, it was an interesting thing, and so, if he's not there to meet you at the train, then they drew a little sketch and you, you see a river up there and you go over the river and then you follow the river down the street and then you go up and you turn left and then his house you should see kind of over here. And so I made a mental note of that and so sure enough, nobody was there at the train. But they said, now when you go, when you're walking along, be inconspicuous, don't talk English or you'll give yourself away. Walk single file behind each other, you know, so you're not, you know, causing a scene. So we get there, and that's what we did. Nobody was there. We didn't talk any English. However, in Romania at that time, nobody had beards, except for the three of us. <laughs> so the three of us are walking you know, with our beards, advertising, we are not from here. We just happened to be, all three, wearing blue blazers. So we looked like the Blues Brothers, <laughs> walking down the street, so, and, but we were single file, we were carrying our luggage, well, that could have been another getaway, giveaway. And so people would be on their doorsteps just watching us go by. <laughs> And we made it to Pastor Titus's house. And we get there, and uh, fortunately, we knocked on the right house. It was him. He welcomed us. We went in. And he said, look, you know, things are really bad. Uh, you know, so tonight, before you go to bed, I'm going to take you to the church. I'm going to lock you in the nursery. 
and you're gonna stay there because if they come and search my house, you won't be here. So that's what we did. We went to the nursery, we, we were locked in there. Uh, and then we, we went on our circuit we, and uh, we were gone for several days. We came back and we stayed with pastor teachers again. And before we were going to go to sleep, he said, okay, I was gonna take you to the church again, but this time I have a better idea. I just got a call from the Securitate, the police, and they want me to come in in the morning and report into them. I don't know if they know if you're here or not. So here's what, what we're gonna do. Um, when, when you get up, get up in the morning, have all your luggage ready, and I'll take you to church and lock you in, and then I'll go to the Securitate. So we get up in the morning, we're all set to go, we come down, he says, you know, I have a better idea. Uh, you stay here, and I will go to the police, and you watch out the front window with my wife, and if, when I come back, if I'm alone, everything's okay. But if the securitate are with me, then I will leave the keys in the car, I will bring them in the front door, you go out the back door when I come in, and jump in the car and drive off. So that was the plan. And uh, you know, I think back on that and I'm thinking, where would we drive to? <laughs> where, I don't have a map. I, you know, where would you go? How's this gonna work out? But that was the plan. And that was the plan that we executed. So any other questions? Okay, we're gonna take a, uh, we're going to turn around. By the way, we we made it. He came back alone, <laughs> and it was not the Securitate uh, who were with him. But you just had a, a sense. These people, they would feed us, you know, a meal. They would use, they would pull, we found this out later, they would pull their their food rations and give it to the church leader who was hosting us or the family who's, uh, that we stayed with. And we would use their food rations so they could put a meal on the table for us to eat. So we were eating, I don't know how many people's food in, in that one meal. But they did it because we were coming to bring them the teaching of the word of God. And they were glad to do that. So what I'd like for you to do is just kind of circle up if you can and answer this question. What are the implications that we have learned about God's heart God's mission, God's strategy. What are some of the implications of what we have been talking about tonight? So Andy, is there a special way to organize people or just go for it? Okay, good. So I'm gonna call you back together. You only have about uh, five or six minutes and then we're gonna interact over what you're talking about, okay? Okay, very good. Wow, that was quick. Usually I have to give a one minute warning and then we, uh, we move from there. But uh, let's just interact a little bit. What are some of the implications? What comes to your mind over the things that we were just talking about uh, from scripture? Do we need a microphone or are we, we okay with this? I don't know how this works. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that can be an, an easy way out in a sense. It doesn't have to be that way, but sometimes that is what we, we find that ambitious person who's ready to go, that brave soul or brave family, and we send them out and we're doing mission. And we are doing missions. The sending is an essential part of the going. 
the going can't happen unless you have the centers who are doing it. So I'm not minimizing that. But there also is we need to be involved in uh, being of use to the Lord. And that's not a guilt trip thing. This is just something we need to learn how to share our faith, how to engage conversations. Okay, what are some other implications? We were having a heated conversation up here. And I think there's a concept there that I, I want us to get a hold of, and that is, how do you measure spiritual growth? You know, is it how much time you spend in the scripture, how much knowledge you have, can you, how many verses, you know? Well, one way to think of it is um, to ask yourself the question, is my heart more like the heart of God today than it was a year ago? So, it's, is my heart expanding when it comes to all kinds of things, in, in worship, in poverty, in missions? Is my heart becoming more like the heart of God as the months and as the years go by? And it's not about a checklist and, okay, notches on your Bible and, okay, I gotta do what I hate to do. You know, I guess I gotta bring up the, you know, and share the, the message. It's not about that at all. It's about, a, it's a heart thing. And, and the heart is sharing and learning how to share. And, and this is probably another thing that we, we don't have time for tonight, but just plant the seed that, yes, you may feel inadequate and you may feel, I don't know how to do it. That's okay. But let that be a beginning point, not an ending point. What will you be like next year? What, five years from now, will you still be saying the same thing? Will you still be saying, you know, I could never do that. I don't have the courage. I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to share the gospel. And I'm saying it shouldn't be that way. You know, as time goes on, we need to be equipped to be senders, to be goers, to be ready every day. In, in a missional way. So I don't know, that's a little bit of what you're saying is our, our heart becomes more like the heart of God and we are learning, it. it's okay wherever you are now, but let's make a determined effort to keep on growing as an equipped servant of God, able to handle the, the word of the gospel. Okay, what else, what other implications? Any, any other thoughts? Anybody back in the back or in the front? Okay, by, by going on some of these mission trips out of the country, you are stretched, you have the opportunity to grow. And I would, do, I would give a caution there. It doesn't happen automatically. There, there are a lot of trips that are taken that you come back with stories and pictures, but you don't come back with your heart having grown. And I think uh, there is a way to help team members to grow on a mission trip and not just have it be a, a spectator uh, uh, thing. But you're right, if you can engage spiritual growth in a significant way by the initial going, the opportunities that are there. That's why one of the things I love about hearing what's happening here uh, at Grace Kingsport is the opportunities that, that are offered. Okay, I do have, uh, Two more questions, uh, and maybe we've answered this a little bit, but if you would just quickly circle back with your group and say, what are the implications of this for our church? How, are there any applications for us? Are there any ideas, or are there any next steps, or you know, what are some implications uh, for our church and uh, for you? When you think of your life a year from now, five years from now, what, what are some implications of what we have talked about? So 
circle up for um, a few minutes. I'll give you three minutes. Okay, let's circle up here. I'm keeping an eye on the clock for us. And I'm gonna have Andy come up and uh, join me here because he's gonna close out our time together. But what are some uh, thoughts, any, anything you wanna share about your discussion on the implications uh, for this church and for you? Any thoughts? Yes. Okay, we are God's messengers, exactly. That's right. And so we need to learn what the message is and be clear about it. We need to pray about opportunities and we need to ask God for the courage to speak the message. Excellent. the need for prayer uh, the implication personally is just the need to, to be willing to pray about being a goer or being a pursuer uh, and then being a good listener uh, of other people and knowing where they're at and knowing what they're dealing with and struggling with and then having a, a sense of urgency and it is the is there preaching in our churches about uh, an urgency to help fulfill uh, the calling and the need to be a, a sending church. That's what some of our folks discussed. Others? It's got to be on our hearts on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, there, if I could just make a comment there, um, that is absolutely true. And I, I, I want us to be careful that we're, we don't swing the pendulum into the guilt zone where there's a sense of drivenness, there's a sense of guiltiness, you know, I haven't and we don't and I could never. You know, we, we need to learn how to sh share our faith. There's a statement, I'll give you a real quick thing, called the Shema Statement. Anybody know what the Shema is? Uh, Shema Yisrael, Hear O Israel, you need Larry Stand back there. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, Hear O Israel, the Lord uh, your God, the Lord is one. Shema, here. And the Shema Statement is a missional tool all of us can use. You're carpooling and you're going to work and and uh, you say, hey, did anybody see that sunset last night? I, every time I see that, I am just amazed uh, of what this world that God has created. That's a Shema statement. It's not the whole gospel, but you're raising the flag and you don't know what that will trigger in someone else. I, I played racquetball for a number of years and I would play with these unbelievers and I would We'd be sweating and you know pounding on each other, and then when we took a break, I'd, I'd say, and some of them were Jewish uh, guys too, and I'd, I'd say, you know, I don't know if you go to church or synagogue or not, but 
Uh, you know, yesterday in church, we just had this amazing thing happen. Or, you know, I had a funeral this past week, and, and this happened. Say, I'm not forcing anything on them. I'm just sharing my life and my thoughts. That's a Shema statement. It's, it's a step into the arena of the presence of God in our lives. And allow the Spirit of God to take it from there. If nothing happens, fine. But if you go silent all the time, rather than just a simple, you know, declaration of, of uh, the Lord's presence, then you, you miss an opportunity. So I'm just saying it needs to be a part of our daily lives. And sometimes a simple thing like that makes it easier for it to be a daily part of our lives. Anything else you want to say to, in closing before we uh, give some final directions? I think what you have going on the rest of this uh, month together, some of the topics that you have and you consider the unreached people groups, understanding the desperate need that is out there and understanding the biblical reality that without Christ, there is no hope. Now, we're being taught something totally different in, in the drift of our culture. But the scripture has always been clear. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That is a, a narrow road. That is a desperate statement of need uh, in our world. And we must not lose sight of, of that because the heart of God is for the lost world. Thanks, Larry. Everybody give him a hand again, please. <laughs> and thanks to you uh, for your willingness to be here tonight, for your, your willingness to, to talk and share uh, in little groups just like we did. I appreciate your willingness to let these words sink into your life and the challenge you and the challenge all of us. So way to go. Great job. Uh, and but before we go, in closing, just a couple of things to remember. One, take some time with us tonight. Sunday, whenever, just wander these tables. Go, go check out the prayer room. You know, go up and pick an unreached people group that you can pray for throughout the year. Let, let some of the tables help you develop your heart uh, in just little pieces, little steps. Uh, there's something unique on every table. These are the trips that we're taking uh, out in the, the cafe where we ate or some, some missional organizations that you can check out. Um, you got the unreached people groups and the Operation Christmas Child out here. All these things are all meant to just help us think about what God is doing in our lives, including the prayer room. It's a neat place to go and just think. There's some stuff to read and look at in there just to prompt some thoughts about what my, God may be doing in your heart. Okay? Uh, a couple other things. A little bit, a little bit of business. Cleanup time. All right? Uh, here's what we're going to do. A through H, if your last name's A through H, tonight's your night to help clean up, okay? And it's going to be real simple. Uh, need uh, a couple people just to wipe off the tables that are out there. Uh, need a person or two to sweep the floor. And then to move tables and chairs. Not all of them, but the center tables, the long ones that our food was on, we're going to move those back to this back hallway. And then... Four tables and four sets of chairs back to the kids' area. Matt, is that good? Four? Okay, all the other tables and chairs, just leave them right where they are. We'll use them again next Wednesday. But four tables, four sets of chairs to move back there. So if you're A through H, we'd love and appreciate your help. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, I say let's go and just consider making God's heart, God's mission, God's strategy, our heart, our mission, our strategy. Have a great week. Thanks for being here.